So what, what I visualize that space is permeated by this kind of fields that, that only come in, in, in tiny quantization. So that there's, there's kind of an excitation of the field that is basically traveling around, bouncing off other excitations and together in a weirdly complex dance creates this emergent classical world. I should say here that I am uh, mostly the theorist here. So I developed the mathematical and theoretical foundations working on this machine. Much of my research that I did in the last 15 years is basically the question of like, how do you get from something that is microscopically reversible to something that's macroscopically non-reversible without any mystery, you know? People usually throw mysteries in there. But then the miracle happens and this comes out. And I'm, uh, I'm convinced you don't need these mysteries. So we're now in, in Vienna at the Atom Institute. What is a quantum field thermal machine? In some sense, it would have to go a little bit, you know, further, further back. The Atom Institute was founded in 1962. At that period, it was the, the booming period of nuclear research. There is at least one new avenue of peace which has not yet been well explored. Eisenhower's speech in 1953, where he mentioned um, that uh, the US is ready to, uh, to support all countries willing to use nuclear power for peaceful uses. It is not enough to take this weapon out of the hands of the soldiers. It must be put into the hands of those who will know how to strip its military casing and adapt it to the arts of peace. Uh, the Atom Institute is, is, is one of the outcomes of uh, President Eisenhower's offer. To bring uh, nuclear physics to the completely devastating center of Europe, you know, after the Second World War. I spent about 42 years at this institute. Of course, it's a lot of memories uh, stored. At that time, it was a period without any computers, without any mobile phones. Every document was either handwritten or by a classical typewriter. I was a small kid and uh, I went a lot of time with my, my father, you know. I got into physics because I'm, I always liked intellectual challenges. It fitted somehow together by, you know, sitting in the garden and watching how a leaf falls down and what type of movement it does and trying to understand, you know, what's going on there. And only in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, computers started to be used and involved in experiments. I got very much into programming and uh, simply because I wanted to program computer games because back then there weren't there was no internet and so you always had to trade these floppy disks. It, it marks a special time in my life also, right? This whole feeling of becoming a bit more conscious of the world and, well, one of the first things to do is to look out into the universe and see what is there? How do these things work? When did we start really thinking about this, this quantum field machine? We have 5,000 atoms in almost perfect isolation. The basic ideas now came probably five years ago or so. As we walk into the room, the first part is really what is the most important to me. That's where the computers are that actually control the experiments, have all these live controls and live results being displayed on the screens. Inside is this refrigerated vacuum chamber. Now here in the lab we create regions of space-time that are colder than anything we find in nature. Our temperatures are, you know, tens of nanokelvin, which is, uh, how do you describe that? Space is colder about the factor of 100 than room temperature. Our atoms are colder by 
another factor 100, another factor 100, another factor 100, another factor 100. So 100 times 100 times 100 times 100 colder. The centerpiece is this atom chip. The atom chip is a relatively simple device. It's just a gold surface with some wires in it that generate magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are used to trap atoms. The first time I gave a talk about these chips in the, at the Max Planck Institute of Solid Physics in Stuttgart, there were five people who jumped up and said, you know, no, you cannot do that because of, you know, 15 review papers who certain effects that would destroy the wires if we sent that much current through. They said, you know, I went into the lab and I tested it. Some people were saying that it was impossible. Guys, you know, it's not like that. We send currents through these wires here and some nice uh, magnetic fields will, will be created around here that will keep our atoms underneath the chip. These wires on, on, on the surface are the, the highways that transport the electrons that will create the magnetic field. Yes, okay, so the last updates regarding heat flow. We effectively trap these 5,000 atoms and keep them in place. They're cooled down collectively to create this, what is called a superfluid. There's a certain part of the system which I can observe, and there's a huge part of the system which I cannot observe because I don't have the tools to it. There is some mismatch between the timings, which I still don't fully understand. But... I can let it run for a couple of times, and then I stop running it, I, I release it from its trap, I let the information flow outside, and your atoms will fall. And after they fall a little bit, you have a camera that captures their position and basically take a picture to the atoms to see where they are, and all the information about your atoms is in that picture. And then I repeat this thousands and thousands of times, and I get a dynamical picture of how it works. So the better you, could, you can do that, um, the better you can understand how things work at, at very, very low temperatures. And that's something one has to appreciate. The experiment happens in complete isolation, but isolation means there is no information leaking out, which means I cannot watch it. I cannot ex watch the experiment happen. I cannot watch the field machine in action because by watching it, I would destroy it. This is the main philosophical departure from quantum thermodynamics versus classical thermodynamics. The fact that you have to take observation into account. We found a way to, to build a system of tens of thousands of particles which had quantum properties. For example, that would mean that we could make heat flow or energy flow from cold to warm and not from warm to cold. And I think this is the most profound change that one has to realize. So, so this is the, the, the status right now. It's my you know, very strong opinion that running after what everybody else thinks is the, is the hot stuff is completely wrong. If you want to see interesting physics, it's often very useful to go beyond the regime that we happen to have naturally around us. Because this really lets us test our theories to the extreme. There are many, many really interesting problems. And nature tells you what the solutions are. You just have to go after them, even if they are hard. I always tell my, my students, you know, experiment is always right. It's always right, yeah? It's always correct. You might not know which experiment you did. <laughs>